Well, welcome back to our study uh, on this uh, interesting prophecy, the prophecy of Nahum, and how we foretold the destruction of the great city of Nineveh. Uh, let's pick up from where we left off last time to begin with. We're looking at uh, Nahum chapter 2 and verse 5. Let's just read that verse again to remind ourselves. Uh, we're, we're speaking about the the invading army coming against Nineveh and what the king there said. Verse 5, he shall recount his worthies, they shall stumble in their walk, they shall make haste to the wall thereof, and the defences shall be prepared. So, if we look at the, the, the map of Nineveh once again, we, we, we can see exactly what happened here. Um, that's how Rotherham uh, translates that verse. Let him, and we suggest that that is the, the, the king who is in the city, let him call to mind his nobles. They shall stumble as they go, which seems to be a strange thing to say, doesn't it? Why would they stumble as they go and as they hasten to the wall to defend it? It's the historian that tells us that when the soldiers were called to defend the city, they were drunken. And that's why they stumble. Nahum speaks about it in chapter 1. While they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. Or another rendering of that verse, if we go to uh, the revised version, he remembereth his worthies, they stumble in their march, they make haste to the wall thereof, and the mantelet is prepared. And we say, what is a mantelet? If we look at the definition of that, it is a movable shelter used by invading armies. So if we look at the, the, the plan once again, we've shown the uh, defending armies there, uh, uh, they've got to the wall, but obviously the invading armies or the other side of that wall, the other side of the river. It's only the river and the wall that's keeping them apart at this stage. And so we come to chapter 2 and verse 6, which reads, The gates of the rivers shall be opened, and the palace shall be dissolved. The gates of the rivers shall be opened. Why would they open the gates? when the invading armies were just outside there. Well, Nahum chapter 1 and verse 8 tells us that Nineveh will be destroyed by water. Back to the historian again. He says that the Kosor River, which ran through the city, flooded broke down the floodgates and part of the wall, which allowed the enemy to come in. So they didn't open the gates of their own accord. It was the river, the river that ran through the city, which flooded and broke down the gates and destroyed part of the wall. So now we've got a situation where the wall has been destroyed whether it was just that section or not, we don't know. But now, all that we've got separating the two armies is the river. And it was relatively easy for the, the invading armies to cross the river and they were in into the city. What does the psalmist say? He commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind which lifteth up the waves thereof. So, as... As I mentioned, it was it was Yahweh that destroyed the city, really, by causing that river to overflow and flood its banks and destroy part of the wall. So now what have we got? The situation is that the soldiers inside, they are now running for their lives as we shall see in a moment. And here we've got the armies. that They are now both inside the city and surrounding it as well. 
it says the palace shall be dissolved. We can see two palaces there. Uh, the palace of Ashurbanipal and also the palace of Sennacherib. I don't know which one it's re referring to. So we come to chapter 2 and verse 7. It mentions Hazab. It means to stand firm. It's speaking about the old city that was impregnable of old. That's what the New King James uh, says concerning that verse. She who stood firm is uncovered and caused to go away. And her slave women are moaning like the sound of doves beating their breast. So here we've got the city described and the uh, invasion of it described in detail by the prophet Nahum long, long while before it happened. Chapter 2 and verse 8. If we just read that verse, chapter 2 and verse 8. It says, Nineveh is of old like a pool of water. Yet they shall flee away. Stand, stand, shall they cry, but none shall look back. It's another verse that needs a little bit of unravelling to find out exactly what the prophet is saying. That's the verse in the ESV. Nineveh is like a pool whose waters run away. Halt, halt, they cry, but none turns back. It's a reference to the soldiers which are now fleeing from the city for their lives. They're like water running away from a pool and the commanding officer cries halt, halt, but they don't listen. They don't turn back when that command is given. Chapter 2 and verse 9 and so the description goes on. Take ye the spoil of silver and the spoil of gold for there is no end of the store and the glory out of all the pleasant furniture. And here we've got a reference to the uh, treasure that's been taken by the Assyrians in, in their campaigns. But now the whole thing is reversed and that is now plundered by the invaders. Chapter 2 and verse 10. There it is in the revised version. She is empty and void and waste and the heart melteth. The knees smite together and anguishes on all loins, and the face of all them are waxed pale. It, it's a description, isn't it, of absolute panic in the city at this time. Here's what the archaeologists have discovered. Uh, skeletons of a number of individuals who met their death on the roadway of the Halzai Gate. There it is. They were running for their lives, but they didn't get very far because the enemy was there. And all that's left now is uh, a few bones and skeletons of these poor individuals who were destroyed at that time. Chapter 2 and verse 11. Well, let's just read it, shall we? Chapter 2 and verse 11. It says, where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion, even the old lion, walked, and the lions whelp, and none is made of, of them afraid. We read here from the British Museum that lion hunting was considered the sport of the kings of uh, Assyria, symbolic of the ruling monarch's duty to protect and fight for his people. We see there the, the one of the Syrians, Assyrian uh, kings, Assurbanipal, hunting lions, and the other uh, painting there shows the, the 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 killing of the lions inside the city. It was a sport for them, and the next two verses in the chapter speak about Assyria as a lion. Uh, chapter two and verse twelve. The lion did tear in pieces enough for his whelps, and strangled for his lionesses, and filled his holes with prey, and his dens with ravin, 
Behold, I am against thee, saith Yahweh of hosts, and I will burn her chariots in the smoke, and the sword shall devour the, thy young lions. We know, don't we, that Assyria was actually described as a lion in prophecy. There's one example. Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First the king of Assyria hath devoured him, and last this Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon hath broken his bones. Daniel also speaks about Assyria as a lion in his description of the, the nations that invade Israel in, in Daniel chapter 7. And so it's in chapter 3 that we get the reasons for judgment. Here we've got John Gill's commentary on, on chapter 3 and verse 1. Nineveh, in which many murders were daily committed, innocent blood shed, the lives of men taken away under the colour of justice by false witness and other unlawful methods, and which was continually making war with the neighbour with the neighbouring nations and shedding their blood to enlarge its wealth and dominions and therefore woe is denounced against it and it is threatened by the righteous judgments of God. And so the judgment comes in, in, in described once again in chapter 3 and Verses 2 and 3, that's ESV down at the bottom there. The crack of the whip, the rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear, hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the dead bodies. A graphic description of what was happening at this time. Here we read what the archaeologists said. They lie as they fell more than 2,600 years ago. A writhing clump of humanity, frozen in a moment of fearful combat. Pieces of armour, iron daggers, pikes and other weapons litter the ground. Buried in the desiccated leg bone of one of the soldiers is another emblem of blood and pain. A triple-bladed bronze arrow had but arrowhead cunningly shaped to inflict maximum harm so here we've got once again part of the graphic description of the fall of Nineveh it's in chapter 3 that we get more reasons for judgment here's how Rotherham describes those verses because of the multitude of the unchaste doings of the unchaste one Fair in grace, mistress of secret arts, who hath been selling nations by her unchaste doings, families by her secret arts. Behold me, against thee declareth Yahweh of hosts. Therefore will I remove thy shirts over thy face, and let nations see thy nakedness, and kingdoms thy shame. And I will cast upon thee abominable filth, and treat thee as the foolish, and set thee as a gazing stock, and it shall come to pass that all who see thee shall flee from thee, and shall say, Destroyed is Nineveh, who will bemoan her? Whence shall I seek any to comfort thee? So these are the righteous judgments of God. There's an interesting principle here that's brought out in, in the book of Proverbs, if we just turn to Proverbs chapter 1 and see what we read there. Proverbs chapter 1 and at verse 22. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity, and the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge? Turn you at my reproof. And Nineveh had the chance to turn. It turned once in the days of Jonah, but not any more. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, and I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called, and ye refused, 
I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded, but ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. And so now it was the turn of Nineveh to reap these righteous judgments of God because they continued to disregard what the God of Israel had warned them about. Nineveh, uh, sorry, Nahum chapter three, 3 and verse 15 tells us that Nineveh was to be destroyed by fire. It was to be destroyed by water, but also to be destroyed by fire. We've seen how it was destroyed by water. We read here from Encyclopedia Britannica, 14 years after the death of Assurbanipal, however, Nineveh suffered a defeat from which it never recovered. Extensive traces of ash, representing the sack of the city by Babylonians, Scythians and Medes, in 612 have been found in many parts of the Acropolis. So there's the evidence that they, the invading armies used fire to destroy the city as well as the water. It was to be destroyed without trace. This is in chapter 1 and verse 9. Yahweh will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. What do we read in Cambridge Ancient History? The disappearance of the Assyrian people will always remain an unique and striking phenomenon in ancient history. You see, ancient history can find no trace of the Assyrian. And that's exactly what Nahum said. Thy crown are the locusts, and thy captains are the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun riseth, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. And this has been the fate of the Assyrians. They have disappeared without trace. And so we've got a summary there of all the details that Nahum predicted would happen to uh, Nineveh at its destruction. Destroyed by water, destroyed by fire, destruction preceded by a siege, sudden destruction, it disappeared without trace. The soldiers were drunken when they were called to defend the city. They flee, they fleed away in terror. Vast numbers were slain. When we look at what historians say about the fall of Nineveh, some of them seem to think that Nahum was there at the time. What they don't realise was Nahum was predicting these things long before they happened. And so we think now about the latter day Assyrian which is also ripe for destruction. The latter-day Assyrian is, of course, Russia and her bands that, that come against the nation of Israel. Read in Ezekiel 38, Thus saith the Lord Yahweh, It shall also come to pass, that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. It's interesting, that word thought is translated imagination again. Elsewhere in scripture, we're given an example there in Proverbs chapter 6. Thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages to them that are at rest and dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. I will take a spoil, I will take a prey and turn my hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited. And we know that when the latter day Assyrian tries to do that, it too will be destroyed.
So it's interesting to make a, a comparison between ancient Assyria and the latter day Assyrians, both deceivers. Here we read what uh, Rab Shaker said to the people of Jerusalem. Don't listen to Hezekiah. Make an agreement with me by present. Come out to me and eat every man his vine and his fig tree and drink every one the waters of his own system until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Deceit coming from Rabshakeh at the time of Hezekiah. What about the latter day Assyrian? Here's the first deception that came from the, the lips of Vladimir Putin. He said, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of the mass media, the right to private property, all these basic freedoms of a civilised society will be reliably protected by the state. And that was in his, his first uh, New Year's speech uh, in the year 2000. That was the first deception which of course deceived many people, many nations as well. Many nations in the West thought, well, they seem to be the same as we are. And we know, don't we, how that at the moment, Russia are deceiving all sorts of people by, by putting out false messages to, to, to confuse. Both hungry for spoil. Here we've got ancient Assyria and here we've got latter day Assyria, both coming to take a spoil and to take a prey. Both dedicated to war. A quote from a book on the British Museum here. A casual glance at the Assyrian sculptures in the British Museum suggests that this was a state dedicated wholeheartedly to war. Vladimir Putin is preparing for World War Three, and there's much more that we could say about that. I'm sure we're all aware of that. Taking lands, not theirs. Here we've got in Isaiah, Assyria described as a river that overflows its banks. In other words, it spreads over to other nations and takes their land. A book here called Beyond Crimea, which shows us that Putin's foreign policy, just read the bottom part of that, his foreign policy and compatriot protection to warn that Moldova, Kazakhstan, the Baltic states and others are also at risk. Both destroyed at the appointed time. Nahum concludes his prophecy. Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria, Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust, thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. There is no healing of thy bruise, thy wound is grievous. And we know that the latter day Assyrian will likewise be destroyed. The Almighty says, I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, an overflowing rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. And that Concluding uh, verse of Ezekiel 38, I find that very assuring. God says, thus will I magnify myself, I will sanctify myself, I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am Yahweh, he who will be, the one who will be uh, mighty nations, mighty armies at that time. And so we come finally to Nahum's latter day prophecy. Just put down the screen there. Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feasts. Perform thy vows. 
for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. And that is expanded for us in Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 52. If we look at Isaiah chapter 52, uh, verse 7, here's the link in verse. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith to Zion, thy God reigneth. And it's all the way through this chapter, if we could pick out one or two other verses, we see it's about uh, Zion, verse 1. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Verse 6. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. And so the chapter speaks about the, the, the glories of the kingdom when the Lord Jesus Christ will be back in the earth. And so we say in conclusion, what of us? Will we be there? Really, the whole message of, of Nahum is about the severity of God. We saw, didn't we, that Jonah spoke about the goodness of God, how that Nineveh was spared in his day. And so Paul says to the Romans, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity. But toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And so the message is for us to humbly come before our God, accept the fact that really we are worthless, but he will be merciful to us in that great day. And we pray that that day may soon come.